hello and welcome to replay value. Gurren Lagann is all about power. Of course, spiral power and fighting spirit plays a big role in all of that. And there's not a lot of strategy in the show's battles, as there is, we're just gonna keep fighting until we overpower our opponents. Which, when you have someone with nigh godlike power, is a totally legitimate strategy. The power of the attacks and the mechs, the looming threat of the opponent's power, all increase exponentially over the course of the series, and well, it just keeps building from there. But what about the people who wield the power of authority in Gurren Lagann? What does Gurren Lagann say about people in power and those systems of governance? What does leadership, formal or informal, mean in the world of Gurren Lagann? Well, just who the hell do you think you're watching? This is Replay Value, and today we're going to be looking at just that. Gurren starts off with a strong anti-authoritarian stance throughout its first core, which kind of figures. The first core is the fight against a king, but its roots begin significantly earlier than that, right from the beginning of the first episode. Jiha Village has a chief, who from the get-go is shown yelling at people to work as opposed to helping do the work. This is compounded when he gets into an argument with Kamina, justified considering the circumstances, though the juvenile and malicious nature of his arguments and blatant favoritism are both strikes against his character, and his cowardice and unwilling to confront the inherent problems of the tremors and high probability of more earthquakes help to make Kamina's distaste of the man crystal clear. The Jihad chief is a traditional authoritarian figure. It's unclear whether he's in that position because of age or legacy, but because of his ability to jail Kamina instantly and his role as the enforcer of his rules, it would seem as though he is the sole authority of Jiha, and the viewer is not made to like him at all. Which holds true for the next major authoritarian figure, the chief of Adai village. This chief couches his order through a religion instead of just brute force. And again, Kamina takes a serious issue with this guy, because he's reminded of Jiha's chief, and because Kamina's idealistic principles, make the impossible possible, are in direct contrast to the realistic approach that is, quote, needed in the village. The chief of Adai is a blatant liar, a cold, calculating utilitarian, and a hypocrite. His word, like the Jiha chief, is the only authority in the village, but now it's a theocratic regime, where his decisions aren't his, but instead of religious fare. Which is why he's a liar and a hypocrite, because he knows that he's sending people to their deaths for a ceremony that was all constructed in his head. However, we're told that the village has improved since the system of no more than 50 people was implemented. So it's clear that Gurren Lagann isn't saying that order is not desirable, but rather that the means by which this order is being implemented is undesirable. The Spiral King is the clearest example of the totalitarian trope. It's blatant despotism, absolute authority vested in one man using violence to maintain order in his own name. Lord Genome is a cruel man in the first core of the show, one who ruthlessly throws away his own daughter and hundreds of others like her once he has no more need for them. He wields large armies and mechs all for the sake of killing humans who rise to the surface, and his order is a dystopia for humanity as they're forced underground to eke out meager lives. I don't feel like I need to explain further why the Spiral King is an authoritarian figure and why he's viewed negatively. I mean, the dude's the primary antagonist. And while his motivations are explained in the second core, his rationalizations for his actions are no different than those of the chief of Adai village. So what do these three authoritarians have in common? Well, they all seek to maintain the status quo. The chief of Jiha isn't interested in pursuing a solution to the tremor problem, the Adai village chief maintains a literal 50-person status quo, and Lord Juno maintains a hierarchy of beastmen on land and humans below ground. Across the board, these men use their power to enforce the same present continuously. And that is what is unsuitable to the world of Gurren Lagann. One of Gurren's major themes is that of evolution, constantly progressing, step by step, inch by inch, until progress is made. That's how spiral power works, it's symbolized by the drill, it's the key tenet of Gurren's universal understanding. To wallow in the status quo, to not move forward, is the absolute worst thing you can do, according to Simone and Team Dai Gurren, and that is why leadership belongs to those who can move forward. When the first gunman falls through the ceiling in the first episode and the chief is unable to deal with the shattering of his status quo and shivers in fear, it's Kamina who looks towards the future that takes the Nodachi, a literal symbol of the transfer of authority in this case, and wins the day. Simon becomes the leader after realizing that he has to keep moving forward, and the rest of the team sees this literally as he digs away when everyone else is unable to make a dent in the rock. The one village chief we see who is positively shown is Dayaka because he welcomes change and is seeking to improve their lot on the surface. Team Daigurin is a makeshift group, and the role of the leader isn't so much a position of authority, but rather the one who everyone can look towards to tell them what the next horizon is and inspire everyone to move forward. That's what Team Daigurin is all about, moving forward to change the future and to make the impossible possible. None of the authoritarians in the First Corps have that desire, and thus they are shown to be incapable of change. 
The second core is interesting because it features Supreme Commander Simon. And while Simon is great, he's not cut out for leadership, and neither are the vast majority of the other members of Team Daiguren. We'll get to Rossiu in a second. It's a reminder that the best revolutionaries aren't the best leaders, because now the people in power are the ones who aren't able to move forward. And Simone is more concerned about people's individual feelings than their usefulness, which would seem to be a degree of stagnation in and of itself. And of course the ultimate big bad, the anti-spiral, is basically a galactic tyrant attempting to keep the universe from falling into spiral nemesis by maintaining, you guessed it, the status quo. And the infinite multiverse labyrinth that the anti-spiral sticks people in is basically establishing a new status quo. This is also the main reason why I don't really have anything to say about the anti-spiral. They're basically the same as all the other villains, just bigger and more obvious. So what form of leadership is acceptable to the universe of Gurren Lagann? This is going to sound like a joke, but democratically chosen leadership. Kamina is accepted as leader by everyone, Kitan replaces him without the approval of everyone and struggles to hold authority, before being replaced by Simone, who everyone agrees is the logical choice. And indeed, by the epilogue, Rossiu is now a president, which I think is fair to assume is meant in the democratic sense, otherwise why not keep the title of Supreme Commander? Just my thought. Authoritarian leadership doesn't give the individual the opportunity to stake out their direction in terms of voting, whereas democratic leadership does, which holds with the Gurren belief of the importance of the individual. Okay, before we end this off, let's chat about Rossiu. This show hates utilitarian thinking, which I've said a few times now and basically just means that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. But as I just said, Gurren's world focuses on the individual. So while it's okay for the individual to make a sacrifice, a la Kitan, it's not okay for someone else to sacrifice the individual. And that's where Rossiu makes his errors. Rossiu is Lord Genome before Lord Genome became entirely removed from his humanity. Rossiu is afraid of what will happen if they hit one million people. He takes actions to try and maintain the status quo, keeping people alive, without attempting to solve the source of the problem, the anti-spiral. He's willing to sacrifice Simone, whose desire to save everyone is incompatible with his own worldview. Rossiu deludes himself into believing that he and those who work for him are the only people who are interested and capable of saving mankind. Unlike the chief of his village, though, he cloaks his worldview in that of the law, and uses those laws like a tyrant to ensure outcomes that he believes are necessary. His assumption that he cannot save everyone, that they will lose to the anti-spiral, and his lack of faith in the Dai Gurren motto return him to that child in a Dai village, which is where he returns when he realizes these failings. I don't really want to talk about whether you believe he's redeemed or not, but the important role that Rasu plays in this story is that he's the proto-dictator showing how all of the other autocrats in the show got started. They believed that what they were doing was the best for everyone, without considering the individuals who were being hurt themselves, and in order to prevent their feared outcome, attempted to maintain a status quo as to never deal with the actual problem. Gurren Lagann is, at the end of the day, about the power to move forward one more step from where you were before, to evolve one moment to the next, and to seize the future. All of the villains in the show attempt to take that from the people, not without reason, but it can't win because problems need to have permanent solutions and time must flow forward. The best leaders in Gurren are those who have the support of the people and set out a clear goal for the future. Because in the immortal words of Simone, well honestly pick any of them. This show's got enough quotes about this kind of thing to make anyone believe that they can make the impossible possible. Who would have thought that Gurren Lagann and Code Geass had an overlapping theme, huh? Leave a comment if you thought this was interesting, subscribe if you're interested in more, two videos are up on screen if you want to watch another analysis right now, and as always, thanks for watching.